Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. And given the, the long list of very distinguished speakers who knew something or know something about cyber that you've had occasion to hear over the last day or so, you're probably wondering why a generalist like myself is now here to keep you from your lunch. And I think the short answer to that, at least from my perspective, is that to use an expression in French, il faut travailler en pleine connaissance de cause. It doesn't matter how brilliant you may be in the particular area in which you're working. If you don't understand the context, if you don't understand how the future is likely to evolve, I would suggest to you that you're going to be less effective than you might be uh, otherwise. So what I want to do today is to try and talk a little bit about the broad strategic environment in which cyber finds itself. I mean, from my perspective, well over 95% of cyber activity falls under the rubric, rubric of national security. And if there's one thing, I'm not very good at coming up with sound bites, but the one that I've come up with is national security is not national. By which I mean, in a federal state, national governments alone can't deal with it. You need the involvement of provinces, municipalities, civil society, and anybody else that you can loop in. And similarly, no one country can deal with a variety of national security issues, including cyber. So international cooperation is absolutely necessary. It was one of my hobby horses when I was still working that I had to convince my colleagues that the federal government of Canada was not going to solve cyber and terrorist problems without collaborating actively with a whole raft of, uh, of other organizations. So let me just try and set the scene a little bit that I'm going to talk briefly about five national security threats, all of which are interrelated. And I think that's one of the characteristics of our current environment. If you believe that cyber can operate in isolation of what a number of nation states are doing or what a number of terrorist organizations are doing, I suggest you're wrong. And that it is helpful to at least be aware of this in a general way as you work your way through uh, your labors. Um, some people in the room are old enough to, know, to remember the Cold War, where it was the United States and NATO on one hand and the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact on the other. And it was actually fairly straightforward in those days. Nation states attacked one another in a variety of means, and sometimes you win, won, sometimes you lost. Today, I would argue the biggest difference is, is that our adversaries, if I can use that expression, are multifaceted. You have nation states, you have terrorist groups, you have increasingly international criminal groups, you have corporations, which is something we tend to forget, we have various elements of civil society, and we have your sons and dollar, daughters in the basements, you know, trying to hack into uh, University of Quebec and uh, Mark's uh, database, and everything else that you can think of. Very different environment, and all of these have different controls, different capabilities, and different resources at their disposal. The other big change since the, the Civil War, thank you, Lord, since the Cold War, uh, is that the targets are also multiplied. It used to be the targets were states. Now the targets are corporations, civil society, universities, and individuals. And I would argue that many of the people in this room have a sufficient profile that a number of countries, not our best friends, have profiles on you and they worry and think about what you do and they pay a great deal of attention of, of your work. And that's another element of this, I think, that you should be aware of. You, you know, you can't function believing that because you're working in the cyber world and you're smarter than everybody else, you have full control over your information and data, because I would argue with great respect, you do not. So let me talk a little bit about what I would call the principal national security threats that Canada and the West are facing in the 21st century. First is terror, terrorism, cyber, Russia and China, what I call the G.5 world and, and United States dysfunction, all of which have a real impact on our ability to deal with national security. So I'll go through each of these as quickly as I can, noting though that there are a whole bunch of others that I'm not dealing with, and my wife, who sometimes listens to my remarks, say that I sound a little bit like Darth Vader because there's not a lot of positive in what I'm going to say. I would note that I acknowledge there's a whole lot of good things that are going on in the world. Education levels are going up, health is improving, things like that. But the things I'm going to talk about, which I believe is helpful for you to be aware of, operate in parallel to this. There are two parallel tracks 
And I guess one of the big issues for the 21st century is going to be to what extent can these parallel tracks be maintained or will the Darth Vader side begin to overtake even more than it has the positive developments that are possible for all of us to, um, to imagine. So let me just say a couple of words on terror. And I want to emphasize up front the interrelationships uh, of all of these. You all know what terror is. Terror is basically committing a crime for a political or religious purpose. Uh, it's perpetrated by a vast array of organizations, the most famous of which are uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS. But there are any number of others around the planet. And I think one of the real dangers that we're facing uh, in respect of terror gr terrorist groups are twofold. Since we haven't had any big explosions in North America, we all sort of think they're going away. Well, that's not true. They're regrouping and they're still very powerful. And we'll find out soon uh, who was behind the bombing events in the United States, or the attempted bombing attempts in the United States. Maybe domestic terrorists, maybe international terrorists. But in all the time that I've spent with CSIS as a national security advisor, I was never able to find a single domestic terrorist who did not have some international links. So they remain a real problem. The other issue I would suggest to you is that they're, they, are not, they are a great deal smarter than we all tend to think. ISIS, for example, when they were running some parts of Syria, had a, a cyber department. They had a media department which ran its operations in English, French, German, Spanish, and a few other languages. They were particularly adept at using uh, social media and the internet to recruit. And if you go into some, some websites today, you'll find out that they're still doing that. So I suggest to you strongly that A, they're not going away at all. And some of these groups are becoming increasingly sophisticated in the area in which you're particularly interested. And that we need uh, to keep worrying about this in an active, active way. And to open a parenthesis, one of the, er one of the reasons I think uh, that national security is so concerned with cyber issues is because if you're a bad guy, the return on investment in cyber is way, way higher than terrorism or a whole raft of other things. You can create a great deal of damage uh, without expending a great deal of money, whereas if you're trying to be a terrorist or a criminal, there's a great deal of risk involved and it's a great deal more expensive. So I'm not going to say a great deal more on terrorism except to emphasize again, it is not going away. They are active on the cyber front. And they are constrained by absolutely no rules. And they don't think in a box like we tend to in the West. And I think that's very important. Even those of you, in particular, I think, in universities who are paid to think outside of the box, you still have psychological and cultural constraints that terrorist groups do not have. So that you, we really need imagination when we try and deal with, I think, the, um, the terrorist threat. Let me say a couple of words about Russia and China. Um, they are, in my view at any rate, revisionist states, which means that they are entirely unhappy with the way the world is organized right now. And they are, about, they are setting about to change how the world is organized. And they have nowhere near the restraints that we have. I think it's generally acknowledged that China has something of the order of 200,000 people working on their cyber front. And that's probably a conservative number. And they, too, have very few constraints. China is reputed to be the vacuum cleaner. They will take in anything they can get anywhere. And there's a debate about how effectively they use the information and the data. But they are very active at it. Uh, and uh, another mistake I think some of us in the West make is that you know they are still the Chinese of some of the movies we see on TV. You know, sort of bumbling along with technology, not terribly sophisticated. Boy, if there's an image that is not correct, that is it. They are extraordinarily sophisticated. They are very good at what they do. And uh, I'm not sure we catch them all the time. The other state that I think that falls in the same category is Russia. They're much more specific. They've had more experience in these matters. But they are very active at trying to do two things. Both of these countries are very active in trying to do two things. One is. Um, confusing us. Uh, this is particularly good on the Russian side. You've all heard and know about efforts to influence uh, elections. There are also massive efforts underway to try and influence the behavior of uh, the diaspora of these countries, what they think, how they vote, and what they do, and generally to shift our thinking in the West. 
I think um, probably Russia does more of this than, than China, but both of them are very, very active. They have an impact on everything from the defense expenditures of the West to um, the kinds of things that you can say in universities. Many of you, I don't know if there are any Australians here, but the major controversy in Australian universities about what is politically, politically correct to say or do in respect of China. It's become a major, major issue with them. China has such a major influence on, on Australia, but it's very difficult now, even in an academic environment, to criticize, to criticize China. Uh, we don't want that to happen here and elsewhere in the West, but it's something I think we need to think about and be aware of. There are a number of other countries that operate on the cyber front and on the terrorist front. Iran comes to mind. Uh, you know, we worry about Iran, for example, because it's a, it's a nuclear state, uh, wants to be a nuclear state, uh, but we forget. They're a very major exporter of terrorists, terrorism. They have given to Hezbollah something of the order of 200,000 missiles pointed at, amongst other countries, Israel and the Middle East. So the capacity for these and a few other states to generate grief uh, is really almost unlimited, in part because, and I speak particularly to the Canadians in the room, we don't feel particularly threatened. Uh, why? Because we have two oceans and we have the United States. And you know we actually need an explosion at the National War <coughs> Memorial or on Parliament Hill to convince us that we are under threat. Now, those of you who work on cyber will be aware that that's not an issue. We are as threatened as any number of other countries in the, we in the West. It's very important, I think, for us to register that if Russia, China, and a few other countries are not our enemies, they are at least our very clear and unambiguous adversaries. And we need to take that into account as we think our way through um, our relations with them. By which I should add, I do not mean that we should ignore the, these two or three or four countries. We still have to dialogue with them. But we should do so, you know, counting our fingers after we shake hands. Uh, they are not our friends, uh, and uh, we need to acknowledge that. Uh, the United Nations has estimated, I think two years ago, that approximately $1 trillion a year in IP is stolen. That's beginning to be a lot of money, even for cyber companies. Um, that is something we need to remember, which is that the IP is stolen not just from governments, but from the private sector and from universities. They do this actively, they do this consciously, and people who are more up to date than I am could give you a raft of example how the theft of IP has saved these countries hundreds of millions of dollars in development, research and development, and how we often see some of the products that we've been working on for decades, we in the West, appear suddenly elsewhere because they were able to steal from us these various and sundry, um, uh, the various and sundry uh, intellectual property. Just one last thought on these countries. You're all aware, if only because you read uh, history, uh, the active level at which espionage operated against the West during the Cold War. I think is generally recognized now that we are either at that level or beyond it in the West. So we are being spied upon at a great rate of knots, and again, governments, universities, the private sector, and civil society. So let me turn a bit to cyber, um, which is an area that particularly interests you, I know. And I sort of divide my rambling thoughts on this into four areas. And I'll only talk about a couple at any rate, but there's cyber war, cyber terrorism, cyber crime, and espionage, and what I call cyber propaganda. Cyber war basically is the issue as to whether or not a cyber generated negative outcome should be governed by the law of war in the same way as it would be if the outcome was generated by kinetic action. In other words, if somebody bombs Ukraine, and destroys their banking system or their uh, oil and gas system, that's an act of war. If the same thing happens because somebody does it through the use of cyber tools, is that an act of war? It's something that we in the West haven't come to grips with and we're gonna have to do that very soon because our adversaries are actively using uh, these devices when they are on a rampage or other. <clears throat> 
Cyber terrorism, I'm not going to talk about a great deal except to say that, as I said a moment ago, there are a lot of terrorist groups very active in this area, uh, and I think they're going to stay active and become more active, and we need to worry about it. Cyber crime and espionage is an area that I wanted to emphasize a little bit because I think we tend to a little bit underestimate uh, this area of activity. And I want to stress here again that it's not just international criminal groups that are involved in, in uh, cyber crime, but countries. For example, North Korea acquires a great deal of its uh, hard currency through the manipulation of cyber tools and basically they steal from banks around the planet. That's just one small example. But you have espionage, IP theft, ransomware, identity theft, cyber bullying, the Internet of Things about which we spoke a while ago and what they can do, hacking for pure, hacking for pure old-fashioned criminal purposes, in other words, extracting money, um, denial of services. All of these are crimes in almost every jurisdiction. They're all growing. I wasn't here yesterday to listen to what the RCMP officer said, but I think if you go into the, uh, go in, if you Google any of these areas, you'll find they're, in, they're increasing almost exponentially. Um, again, the return on investment in any of these activities is very, very good. Um, there was an article in the, uh, the Economist a few months ago that if you go on the dark web, and, you know, I'm sure you all know how to do that, but would never do it, of course, um, and you, you, you find the right uh, address, you can acquire a thousand stolen credit cards. They sort of sell them by packs of a thousand now. You can also find people who are willing to kill you if you want. So my point is, criminal activity using cyber tools is almost all-encompassing. Uh, ransomware is going through the roof, uh, and I think denial of service has been used in several instances over the last little while. And it's something I believe that we, we, have to use, we have to worry about a little bit more. And here again, the targets are governments, corporations, and universities, as well as private individuals. What I call cyber prop, cyber propaganda. Uh, this is the general area of using cyber tools in order to either manufacture uh, incorrect news, defacing websites, and all of this kind of activity. This is undertaken, again, by a wide array of entities, governments, terrorist groups, criminal groups now, <clears throat> pardon me, and elements of civil society. Um, the reason I emphasize this again is that I think there's not enough attention given to this. Uh, we are sort of, I deal a fair bit now with the private sector since I've retired, and uh, just about everybody admits that, you know, they don't really think it's going to happen to them. Uh, and they don't really take a great deal of precautions until something happens. But, you know, imagine you're the CEO of a company or the, the rector of a university, and all of a sudden you're told if you don't, you know, give up either some IP or, you know, a half million dollars, uh, it's going to be spread throughout the internet that you're a child pornographer. An increasingly frequent tool these days, and it's used more and more. Anyway, cyber propaganda, something else to deal with. <clears throat> the other element I wanted to deal with, and I only have two to go, is the fact that we're dealing in a G.5 world. You'll remember that during the Cold War, it was a G.2 world, Soviet Union and the United States, and at one level, it was a fairly stable world. We hated each other, we knew what our parameters were, we had spheres of influence. Today, whatever you may think about the United States, uh, the rise of China and of other countries, I think, have created an environment where there is no one leading country in the world. I'm not sure under the current U.S. president the United States wants to lead, but putting that aside, it makes a great deal of difference in dealing with a whole raft of issues. Um, to give you one example, um, there's a strong belief amongst a large number of countries that the Internet is way too free, way too open. And there's a strong measure, uh, pressure underway, <clears throat> excuse me, to redefine the governing rules of the internet so that basically nation states control internets within their borders. And you'll be aware, as I am, that in the case of China, for example, they're basically recreating their own internet within their borders. And a number of countries are trying to do this. Um, so the fact that the United States or some other significant countries aren't really taking the lead on this anymore, and this is just one example, I think is having a real impact on how we're able to deal with a whole raft of national security issues, including cyber issues. Um, 
you only need to think, for example, of uh, the Middle East and what the relative reduction in the influence and power of the United States has meant there. I mean, tensions have gone through the roof over the course of the last little while. And I think that's true on a whole range of, uh, range of fronts. The other is the United States itself. The United States, what I call dysfunction, because I'm not trying to be rude. I think the United States general retreat inside its borders started before the current incumbent of the White House. It started with Mr. Obama and even Mr. Bush. But it does mean that a whole raft of suppositions that we make about who's doing what to whom and how we're doing it uh, are now in balance. Now, I'm told that in the national security area, beneath the political ra radar, things are continuing much as they always have been. But if we don't continue to cooperate, collaborate on a fairly effective level, because the United States is sort of losing interest, uh, it's going to affect the capacity of universities to collaborate, countries to collaborate, and civil societies to collaborate. Not good at all, I would argue, um, for all of us. So there are a bunch of other issues that I could talk about. Nuclear proliferation is becoming a major concern on the planet. Significant links with cyber again. Um, the United States has indicated it's going to withdraw for the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, but that's only the beginning of the issue. Several other states, several states are now arguing with themselves about whether they should become nuclear powers. We haven't had this debate in the last 20 or 25 years. So, you know, then there are the issues relating to migration, to climate change, and a whole raft of others. What I'm trying to say, without being unduly negative, is that the world in which we're living uh, has a whole series of elements that are interconnected. And in some ways, cyber is connected to all of them, and in some ways, cyber is the enabler that we didn't have in the past. And it seems to me that um, for those of you who are working in this area, having this in the back of your mind is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, because if you don't, a whole raft of people around the planet do have it in the back of their mind and it will have an influence on with whom you can deal with. Um, you know, pick a country in Asia, for example, with whom you as university professors or officials want to collaborate. You've have, you have collaborated for the last 10 or 15 years, yet the Chinese influence in that country is so great now that you don't know with whom you're really dealing. Uh, and I think it's something we need to remember. Uh, academics, and I apologize to those of you who are academics in the room, uh, have as one of their benefits, one of their advantages, is the ability to be open, transparent, and to dialogue with anybody with the intention of promoting uh, knowledge. Well, that's not a generally shared view uh, across the planet. Many countries now believe, many being a handful, that what they want out of this is the ability to extract what you're doing for their own purposes and not share it. And they don't share a great deal either. So all of this, I think, comes up makes what I call a fairly toxic stew. Not much that we as individuals can do a great deal about, but I do think it's helpful if we have some general sense uh, of the fact that it's going on, and that you know, once a month or once every six months, we should remind ourselves that there are a whole bunch of people out there uh, who are out to complicate what we're trying to do uh, on uh, national security generally and on cyber in particular. And I come back and stop there. We in Canada, I think, have a particular problem because as I said earlier, we really don't feel threatened. Uh, now I'd like to think that those of you who work in cyber recognize it doesn't really apply to the cyber area for those who are working in it. But generally speaking, there are all sorts of polls, formal and informal, that suggest we really are living in a bit of a la-la land. You know, we think we're protected by the three oceans, as I said, and with the United States. It's not true. I mean, even on the terrorist side, you know, we have 30 to 35 people in penitentiaries for terrorist-related offensive. We've sent a couple hundred people abroad to fight in Syria and Libya and elsewhere. And we've had somewhat less than 100 who've come back to Canada. So we are affected by what's going on in the world on the terrorist front. We are certainly affected on criminality and on cyber. I don't need to convince you. So I apologize for the Darth Vader nature of my speech. But I do think it's not unimportant for you to realize that these things have an impact on what we all do on a day-to-day -day basis.
and again, I come back to the point that I do realize there's another stream where a lot of positive things are going on, but there's not that many uh, that are parallel that interface with the world that I've talked to. So thanks very much. <laughs>